Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. Go to strengthguild.com, S-T-R-E-N-G-T-H-G-U-I-L-D.com. Scroll down to the Iron Radio Collections, and we've got new shirts and new banners for you to support the show. Everything from just a regular banner, regular shirt, to ones with sayings on them, like Lonnie's Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree shirt. And some news for you, we're going to have some contests for people who own these shirts and things. So if you support the show, we'll let you more on that later. So if you get in on these early, you can be one of the first people to win some prizes. So, thank you very much. Go check out the site, strengthguild.com. Scroll down to Iron Radio Collections and support the show. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiologist, and I'm a nutritionist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. Uh, this is Phil Stevens, strength coach, powerlifter, Highland Games athlete. That's about it. Hi, this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson. Faculty member at the Kerrig Institute, owner of Extreme Human Performance, created the Flex Diet Cert, and I'm actually at home, amazingly. Nice, nice. Yeah. Okay, everybody, uh, we've got a show for you that's going to focus on, at least after the break here, uh, sub-goals versus totals. So I think a lot of people, they have big sweeping goals, like I want my total to go up in powerlifting, or I want my body weight overall to go up on the scale in bodybuilding, but what happens when you want to target specific areas? That's what we'll talk about. Um, Also, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say the fall funds drive is going on right now. Uh, Thank you for the people who have donated one-time donors or or new subscriptions. Uh, Those thanks go out in the show notes. So if you have um, iTunes, essentially, you see the show notes, or if you have a uh, podcatcher, that's an old word, isn't it? If you have an old-timey uh, way to get your all of your podcasts on your device, you'll see it in the show notes, So, meaning your name, right? Because we are grateful for that stuff. So, um, Okay, let's get to some of the news. Strength and Muscle Sport News. This first one I thought was interesting. This is from Advances in Nutrition. Uh, which is one of the journals from uh, one of my main groups. Uh, brand new. This is actually published ahead of print, and that doesn't sound too shocking to Mike or Phil. Like This stuff happens every once in a while, like an EPUB ahead of print, but this is December of this year. So this is brand new stuff from uh, Joshua Hudson and colleagues. Protein intake greater than the RDA differentially influences whole body lean mass responses to purposeful catabolic and anabolic stressors. So this is a a systematic review and a meta-analysis. They're basically focused on that key word, which is stressor. Like when you're under stress, the RDA is really not enough. A a lot of us, we talk about the differences between our listeners and the general population, right? The gen pop. Uh, And this is really underscoring that. So it says... Under stressful conditions, such as energy restriction and physical activity, the RDA for protein of 0.8 grams per kg per day may no longer be an appropriate recommendation. So these guys went, a, a, you know, took upon this large review. Uh, three researchers independently screened 1,520 articles. So 1,520 articles. Um, they looked for randomized, controlled, parallel studies, Uh, at least six weeks long, uh, with apparently healthy adults at least 19 years old. Um, Data from 18 studies were finally chosen. Uh, There were 22 actual comparisons within those studies. Uh, Anyway, among all comparisons, protein intakes greater than the RDA benefited changes in lean mass relative to consuming the RDA. Now, this isn't huge, but it's um, a third of a kilo, so, you know, not even a pound, but again, over six weeks. And this is just lean mass. 
right? So something to think about there. Um, it says, in the subgroup analysis, protein intakes greater than the RDA also attenu attenuated lean mass loss after energy restriction. So after some you know, serious dieting. Uh, and again, about a third of a kilogram was retained when people ate more protein compared to the RDA. Um, also, increased lean mass was uh, concluded after resistance training. So instead of after dieting, this is just after resistance training and trying to make gains, um, 0.77 kilograms. So closer to, you know, three quarters of a pound or a pound. It says uh, they did not conclude that there was any differential effects on changes uh, in lean mass under non-stressed conditions. And herein lies a lot of the original debate, I think, right? Like Pete Lemon, my old advisor, or Mark Tarnopolsky, or Duncan McDougall. I'm thinking a lot of the guys that did some of the original stuff. Obviously, Robert Wolf and uh, some of his people, Tipton, Biolo. A lot of them were sort of saying there's no RDA for weight trainers, right? But they probably need more. And that's what this is really sort of underscoring. This is a sweeping review. They conclude the RDA for protein is only adequate to support lean mass in adults during non-stressed states. And I think a lot of our listeners will be like, well, duh, Lowry. But again, th this stuff needs to be documented so we can move forward, right? But the current state of the literature says eating protein above 0.8 grams per kg. In fact, a lot of data would suggest maybe double that, like 1.6 grams per kg, um, is better for retaining mass, whether you're dieting or you're lifting to try to push forward and make gains. So I thought that was interesting, brand new. And it's just nice to see the literature sort of catching up. Those researchers are from Purdue University. So. Nice. That kind of matches what we had in the old uh, textbook we did. Yeah, that fills on the cover. Yeah. Yep. Um, this other one I have, I thought would be interesting to you, Mike. Now, this is for the eggheads out there. This is pretty tangential if you just want to, you know, make uh, hashtag gains with a Z. But um, <laughs> learning about human appetites from the common fruit fly. Now, what this is about, the reason it's caught my eye is partly because of you, Mike, again, because um, this is about uh, nu nutrition and metabolic flexibility and ability to grow. So obviously researchers use animals as models and you might think, well, people aren't like flies. Well, we are in a couple of ways and that's what this talks about. So it says insights into the diets of the tiny common fruit fly may help provide understanding into how humans evolved to eat what we eat. And this was in um, cell reports and it's from Kyoto University in Japan. Uh, so it says the common fruit fly can eat a wide range of foods and is called a nutritional generalist. Now, th why, this matters because human beings are also nutritional generalists. Hence, you know, Mike's focus on flexibility, right? You can adapt to eating more carbs. You can adapt toward eating more fats. We don't talk about it a lot on this show, but I've even written articles before about getting – some people become adapted to protein after, let's say, a week, two weeks, or more, and they actually oxidize protein better as well. So we can we, – and, and that's not usually a fuel source, of course, but – Anyway, so flies are nutritional generalists like people. Uh, however, there are some fruit fly species that have very strict diets, and they are nutritional specialists. So what the researchers did was they gave them three different diets, a high-protein diet, a high-carb diet, and then a medium-protein slash carb diet. Um, the common fruit fly, the generalists, grew under all diets, so, in other words, their metabolisms adjusted to become better at living on protein, living on carbs, or living on a mix. Uh, so they adjusted, uh, and they survived, and they grew. They grew nicely on these things. That did not happen with the specialists. And I don't know if this is a word of warning to people who are too specialized. You know, I'm always a little concerned when I see people remove whole chunks of, like, uh, the food guide pyramid, if you will, you know, the the dietary recommendations, removing whole food groups. That always concerns me a little. And I don't want to say the keto people are in this camp, but again, it, at least animals with the genes to be specialists, they don't grow very well um, at all, 
when they're provided with these diets that don't match their specialist nature. So it says, um, again, the common fruit fly grew under all diets. The specialist only survived under the high protein diet. Um, due to differences in genetic signaling pathways that regulate the body's response to carbs, essentially, in the nutritional generalists. So the generalists, like people, have that flexibility. So according to the authors, quote, various species in nature show complex adaptations to diverse environments whose underlying mechanisms remain to be elucidated. And then I went and pulled the actual paper. This is from uh, Watanabe. W-A-T-A-N-A-B-E, Watanabe and colleagues, sell reports. Here are the highlights they said. And by the way, Mike, if you're interested in this at all, there's a very cool graphic that comes with this that caught my eye. So it's a colorful graphic that basically shows the difference between uh, metabolic flexible type and the metabolic specialists and what happens and the, the mechanisms behind it and the ultimate result at the bottom, which is lo- the larvae grow like crazy in the flexible ones and not so well in the specialists. Uh, In any case, the highlights here, it says the generalists adapt to various nutrient balances, whereas the specialists cannot. The generalists regulate carb-responsive gene expression by activin signaling. The specialist species are defective in carb-responsive gene regulation. So again, they can't can't adjust. Uh, And then lastly, uh, the specialist accumulates various metabolites uh, that reduces adaptation. So again, something, again, I know it's a fruit fly model and you're probably rolling your eyes, some of you listeners, but, um, you know, these, these animals, they, they live shorter lives. You can watch them through their whole lifespan, I, I, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and you can find ones that are extreme specialists. This makes me think of like vampire bats or, you know, some animals are so specialized and people aren't like that. We're omnivorous. You can see enzymes in our digestive tract for all kinds of things. You know, from spe- things that are specific to meat to, you know, all different kinds of things. But I don't know. What were your thoughts on that, Mike, since you're the metabolic flexibility guy? Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's what I've, I pulled up the study here and found it. And, yeah, I've talked about, I don't know if it was on this program or something I wrote a while back about mice who are better able to use fat, show some health benefits and possible less use of amino acids for uh, growth. So yeah, this kind of kind of supports the, uh, it's not just my theory, but just the theory of metabolic flexibility being better related to survivability. And that in theory should translate to better gains with a Z. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, literally in that colorful infographic at the bottom, it shows a yeah, big larva. It says larval growth, you know, and the flexible yeah. ones are just growing like weeds and the other ones are screwed unless the diet is perfect. And I think that explains some of the data, like I'm sure you guys have seen data from, you know, pretty high level elite athletes that you look at it sometimes you're like, what the hell? You're eating like fast food twice a day. Like the the quality is, I would say, not very good, but a lot of times they can do okay. Now we can argue later that may have a cost later and maybe have health implications. Um, But Maybe if you're a little bit more genetic elite and if you're just doing a massive amount of work and pulling just a crap ton of energy through the system, you're very metabolically flexible. Maybe you can convert more of those things and have uh, less harm than what we would think. And then the last part, there was a human study that was done where they compared a population of humans that were trained versus untrained. And they gave them a big bolus of glucose via an IV. And then they also gave them a huge bolus of uh, intralipid via IV, which mm-hmm. is just basically fat. So they ramped up a ton of carbohydrates. They ramped up a ton of fat. They bypassed digestion on purpose. And in English, what they found was if you were trained, your body's ability to, to buffer this kind of metabolic insult was much better than if you were not trained. All right? So not a shock to anyone, but you know, exercise and everything else we do has a massive effect upon it. Yeah. Um, even in sports nutrition class with undergrads, sometimes I'll show some data that, uh, for example, if you're on a very high carbohydrate diet, you tend to dump lactate more readily. And I have colleagues that would say, oh, look, you know, on your exercise test, you just dump lactate so quickly you're out of shape. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Or you're carb adapted, right? Like you can adapt to the specificity rule, right? Applies to diet as well as it does to exercise. 
it, but I think that's not a, a problem. That's actually interesting. It's only a problem in exercise science when we don't do nutritional controls. So if you're assessing fitness status, for example, and you're using lactate as your marker, it's like, well, yes, that may mean you don't have enough mitochondria and you over-rely on uh, quote-unquote anaerobic pathways, but it may be that you're also a huge carb consumer. So you better have some dietary controls in these studies too, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. The big thing on that is you have to look at what is the performance that they're able to achieve. If it's an extremely high-level athlete, like high-level rowers can produce massive amounts of lactate, but they're also producing a massive amount of force and power at the same time. So in that case, you're like, okay, that kind of makes sense. Um, I've seen some people who are just hanging out at rest. Their body is just spinning off a ton of lactate. That makes me super worried, right? Because yeah. you shouldn't have to do that at, at rest. You don't need that high energy system at that time. But yes, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I should digress, right? Typically, like onset of blood lactate, it, it is a marker for fitness. It's not completely invalid. It's just right. that the person coming into the study, their previous diet matters, you know? Of course, and, absolutely. In, in fact, um, gosh, I remember Lance Armstrong, one of the things they used to say about him a lot was that he would just not dump lactate. It really high percentages of his max. He's just, I don't know, he's got so many mitochondria or, or uh, ability to, for gluconeogenesis or whatever it is, he, he just didn't dump lactate apparently. And I know people say, oh, he was on drugs. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into that conversation, right? But the point is, it, it was one of the things that he was really good at, regardless of how he was really good at that. Uh, that's just kind of fascinating. So, Yeah. And my little last bit of caveat to add to that is that, remember, when we're uh, measuring any of those things, we're only measuring the amount that's in the blood. So he could be producing just a piss ton of lactate, but he could be just buffering a ton of it, the hydrogen ions and all that other stuff at the same time, or yeah. burning through it as a fuel. Yeah. So when we pull the actual blood levels, it's really not that bad. Yeah. So, and that's that's the hard part about just looking at a blood level. It doesn't really tell us what the uh, appearance and disappearance is. It's just the difference. Right, yeah. That's what I meant by gluconeogenesis. And I, I don't want to... Yep, right, correct. Adjacent fibers take up the lactate and turn it back into pyruvate for make it useful kind of thing, you know. Yep. Uh, let, let, let me ask you, Phil, um, as far as dietary flexibility do you purposely try to eat a wide variety of things do you go through periods of like when you weight gain or you weight lose do you super specialize on a, a macro how do you do it uh, i try to keep it as varied as possible most times the only time i ever vary from that is like right after a meet because i've been eating everything times four yeah, uh, yeah. Um, i tend to go a little lower carb for a little while you know, because I've been having all of them. Um, <laughs> right. So I just think it's a good idea, you know, to back down every once in a while. And I'll usually do that once or twice a year where I just go through like a two week period where it's fairly low carb. But then I go back to to my regularly scheduled programming. So where it's lots <laughs> of vegetables and potatoes and rice and meat and fat and yeah. you know, a little bit of everything. Yeah. So I think that's consistent with what we've sort of um, preached if you will, over the years, which is the one thing that's going to go up or down more, the percentage wise, not just in, in dose and grams, but in percentage is probably carbs, you know, gains, yeah. the carbs are probably going to be higher when you're trying to lean down, oh, the yeah. carbs are probably lower. I mean, so long as your fat's under control. Yeah, I mean, honestly, when I'm going up, I don't even pay attention to my protein. Because I know by eating that much, I'm getting it. Right. You know, yes. I'm just by default. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So. I have even noticed just in college men, uh, every year we do a big diet project with sort of think like, you know, college freshmen and sophomores. It's like a nutrition 101 class. I've been doing this for decades, I guess. And they, they even those guys, when you're eating like 3,000, 3,500 calories a day, they're eating so much. They're not really nutritionally deficient in anything. Right, sort of to your point, like, do you have to look at protein? Why bother? You're you're yeah. almost certain to be probably double. <laughs> yeah, you know exactly. So yeah, yeah, especially in that population, they're already sort of pre-programmed to focus on protein too. Mm -hmm. So it's usually not going to be an issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even fast foods. I mean, they might yeah. be low quality sources of protein, gre greasy meats and stuff like that. But it's sort of protein and carb focused. You know, uh, well. Protein, fat, carb, there's uh, combinations, I guess. But yeah, there's plenty of protein in a, in a typical American's diet. So uh, at least if they're young and eating, right, lots of calories. Yeah. 
Okay, um, that's about it uh, for the news. You guys have anything um, pressing? No, not really. Nothing okay. too exciting no. going on right now. How's the single ply world, Phil? Oh God. Uh, <laughs> I put my bench shirt on for the first time. So I got my bench shirt. I don't have my squat suit yet. And I put that on for the first time Thursday. Oh, uh, nice. It's painful. It's going to be a whole different world. But uh, I did about eight reps, and I'm covered with bruises. And, oh. Uh, I'm, uh, let's just say I'm glad I ordered a shirt that's a, a size too big. Oh, wow. It's, yeah, it's just that. So, But, I mean, that's it took. Thing, right? Yeah. Oof. And uh, what it took, I just wanted to see what it took to touch. And I had to have 275 on the bar. Oh, wow. Touch. Just to touch? Yeah, to touch my chest. <laughs> so it's pretty tight. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a different animal. That's but, funny. Uh, I think, I honestly think the the shirt is going to be the one that takes the most work to get used to. I don't think the squat suit's going to be that big of a deal. I mean, I'm used to wearing briefs, which I know this is a big jump up, but it's just a totally different groove that you're in with, yeah. a, with a bench shirt. Than, than you're used to. It's a little lower. Make sure your elbows are way tucked in. Uh, mm. But yeah, it'll be fun. I mean, it's going to be fun, something fun to learn is what I'm looking forward to. It's kind of exciting to, to do that. Okay, i got to learn something totally new after all these years. So, Do you yeah. find a lot more like massive involvement of the triceps then because of that change in position? Again, I know you just yeah. it. Well, yeah, and that's where I, I don't... Uh, I'm not sure how much it's going to help me because I'm I'm really long armed, so I'm mm. I've always been strong off the chest oh, on my okay. bench. It's my lockout that fails, so I'm going to have to really build up my lockout. But uh, and we'll see. I mean, like I said, I wasn't going to go up near my max. Everybody's like, yeah, I threw out a bench shirt. And I did 20 pounds over my max on day one. I was like, no, nah, I'm not going oh, there. God. I'm just going to try. <laughs> it's like a horrible learn. idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to try and learn this thing. So, uh, and like I said, I just want to see on night one where where I could touch and. You definitely, it's not a rep thing, man. You can't do reps. I mean, doing one rep with 275, <laughs> it took about 45 seconds for it to get down to my chest. So you're turning purple. Oh. And then it finally touches it. Boom, you can throw it up. But uh, So I couldn't imagine even trying to do reps. Oh. Um, maybe a really hard double. But your time under tension is massive. So hmm. but it'll be fun. It'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. I should have my squat suit by the end of next week. So it's coming from... Finland, I think. So. You know what you said is interesting to me that it's actually going to change the way that you train. Like you're going to have to do more like lockouts and triceps work. And oh yeah, like yeah. it changes the game. You know. Yep. Just yeah, I don't know. It's totally that's... different. So I really don't see it helping me much. Aside from uh, my shoulder won't hurt, so I should be able to move more. But I mean, actual, I don't see like my numbers going up greatly because of that. Because my weak point is. From is at the lockout. Yeah, so, but if I, I can train pain free, yeah. So if I can, but if I can train pain free, I'll be happy. So true. That's true. That's my main thing. So yeah, I see. once I once heard somebody say, um, the groove is so specific, and I mean I've never done this. I think this would be fun. I would never compete, but yeah. it, it'd be fun to try it. Like he was saying, like with your. If your wrists are, you know, just slightly in a position of flexion or extension, like you'll dump it, you know, because you're riding yeah, this yeah. groove almost like a any piece of equipment, I guess. I'm trying to think like a NASCAR driver, and you got to keep the yeah. wheel in just the right s sweet spot, or yeah. you'll dump it, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like driving a piece of equipment as opposed to it being all all your own mm -hmm. pecs and delts, mm -hmm. and you know. Mm -hmm. No, and I could definitely feel that with just a little bit. I did. So, because I got out of spot, got out of the, the right spot a few times, and uh, yeah, if your elbows come out a bit, it just starts falling, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's weird. So, it'll be fun though. I, you're, no, you don't have elbow problems, right? No. Nope. Well, there mm -hmm. you go. So, yeah. you know, that way you're taking the one joint that has problems, and you're sort of making that nice and tight and secure. I yeah. think it's a good time in your career to play with it, honestly, because, you know, yeah, I'm exactly. always joking how, how you're a ball of scar tissue and stuff. So maybe, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, and honestly, at this point, it's like, uh, what more do I have to prove? You know, mm -hmm. I can try something new. I've done that other thing for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, ages ago, did you, did you ever be play around with, you know, shirts and Double nope, ply or anything time. or no, this never. Is my first time ever in a shirt. Yep. The <laughs> only thing I've ever worn is a pair of briefs. So, 
And that's been about 10 years ago. I put on a pair of those for the first time. So, and I've been training in those almost since then. Um, hmm, interesting. But you don't get a lot. I mean, like I can throw my briefs on and they're like, they're really like supportive compression underwear. I mean, I can lift my leg up, move all around. I don't lose any mobility in them at all. Yeah. Yeah. So, but this suit, I'm sure, will be quite a bit tighter than that. If this bed shirt is any indication of how tight this suit is going to be, I'm in trouble. So, <laughs> <laughs> what an adventure, though! It'll be fun. Yeah. We should probably have like a a weekly update, like the Phil's yeah. transition into you know, um, I don't know, geared lifting kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and the first thing like people at the gym were asking me is because we have several sling sh- slingshots, which is like a stretchy. It's a stretchy like knee wrap material. That goes across your chest and hooks to your arms. And, yeah, it's even totally different than that. I mean, they have they're, – they're like each other a little bit, but the slingshot stretches, so it'll unload slowly and then kind of has an elastic motion going up. This shirt has no give. I mean, all it's doing mm. is literally crushing you. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's compacting you as you go down, and that's where the stretch comes from. You know, I mean, it's like – so it was, it was different in that way. It's, it's painful. I yeah. mean, it's not comfortable at all, but – that's yeah, I can weird. See why a lot of people stay away. From it. Yeah, that's weird that it's not so much elasticity. I just thought it would be stiff no, elasticity. It's crushing you. You're the elasticity. Yeah, you're the elasticity. Mm. There is no stretch to this fabric at all. I mean, there's zero give. Um, all across your chest and through your arms. Abusive. So it just it just squishes you as it goes down. <laughs> but, Aggressive power lifters at it again. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to break. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, sub goals instead of just totals or, or whatnot. So we'll be back in just a minute. Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, you know who this is. Uh, so I'm here to tell you about uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson's uh, new book, uh, Why You Should Eat Keto. I don't do it because, I mean, look at me. Come on, I'm fabulous and I'm fantastic. Anyway, you should text the uh, Keto ebook all in one word to 44222 to receive your free copy. Do it. Do it now. Stop feeling. Some of us don't understand how lucky we are to be living in this land. Hi, listeners. This is Rob Fortress Fortney. I'm here to remind you that as the holiday season approaches and your thoughts turn to giving, we like you to keep Iron Rated in your thoughts. Over the past several years, there have been hundreds of listener comments hoping that Iron Radio stays on the air for years to come. Iron Radio is here for you. But as with any public radio type format, the show is listener supported. That's where you come in. For just $4 a month, you become a supporting member, keeping your weekly dose of education, experts, and gym talk flowing. Just go to www.ironradio.org and click on the $4 monthly subscribe button near the bottom of the page. Or... Click the Donate button at the right of the page for a one-time donation. You are the Iron Brotherhood and Sisterhood. Of course, not everyone can afford to be a supporting member or a significant one-time donor. But for those of you willing to pitch in $4 per month or $50 just once, we're about to sweeten the deal. Become a supporting member or major donor between now and January, and a limited number of you will receive a gift worth over $20. And we will never forget our existing supporters. Simply email me via ironradio.org, and I'll send you a free seminar from Dr. Lowry on how to significantly and realistically boost your testosterone levels. Help your iron brothers and sisters who cannot pitch in but deserve better internet programming in our sports. And happy holidays. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what, 
Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that. And uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single digit uh, royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, folks, we're back. It's Phil and Mike and Lonnie, and we're going to talk about sub-goals, not just totals. Uh, and this can be true for both powerlifters and bodybuilders, and I imagine almost any sport, um, mm -hmm. highland games, strongman, whatever. Uh, but I have a couple of questions, just talking points. Uh, let me give you an example of what I mean by sub-goals. Like maybe you're going to target just your deadlift instead of working on your total right for your next meet or the the analogy for a bodybuilder might be bringing up your back instead of just moving up a weight class right your whole body weight so targeting in specializing on things instead of just trying to get better overall um so phil let me ask how, first of all how prevalent are sub goals like that among power lifters versus just going for a bigger total is that common I think it's very common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's especially after. At first, we just got to get everything up. You know, you're just weak. Weak. Yeah. So, and then eventually, everybody is usually everybody will have a lift or two that is behind. Um, like a lot of times, you'll have people that are built to squat, and those people are usually built to bench, and then there's people who are built to deadlift. So, and that's usually due to limb length. You know, most of your good squatters and good benchers are short limbed, and generally, you don't find somebody with really short legs and really long arms. So they usually have short legs and arms. Um, and they're fairly good at benching and squatting. And then a lot of times your long-legged lifters are, are long-limbed, uh, are good deadlifters. So then those good deadlifting people, we need to take a lot of extra time and, okay, let's build your squat up or vice versa. You know, the squatters and the benchers, we need to spend extra time on your deadlift. Um, and at a certain point, it's just, even though it's three lifts, it's just too much to expect to get to come up in a in a big way at one time. You know, you're just you're splitting too much work across too much stuff. Like if I'm trying to just okay, I'm really going to concentrate on my squat bench deadlift. That's a lot. <laughs> oh, you know, that's and that's probably too much for me to recover from when you start talking strong people. Yeah. And you know. So. No, I hear you. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fairly prevalent. I mean, look look at what you, you've just done in the most recent I don't know, a couple of years, really. The yeah. focus was, it's not like you ignored your deadlift. You did kind of ignore, no. ignore your bench, to be frank, probably. But, yes. Yeah, I did. <laughs> but that, that focus was the squat, and you really brought it up, and that was mm -hmm. that's affected your total because the, yeah, you know, the squat's bigger. Total. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so. But what about commonality or prevalence of, the, of that 
weakness, that, that sub-goal, is it more common for people to need to work on their squat versus their deadlift, or is it pretty even, like 33% each of, for each major lift as, as far as wh- who's lagging and what? Does one of those lag the most, and you see a lot of people trying to work on their X? Honestly, it's usually from the gen pop position. Like people come from gen pop into powerlifting. It's usually never the bench because they've all done that. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I've had tons of people that come in and they're like, they're benching what they squat. Okay. We need to ignore your bench for a little while. Your squat sucks. (laughs) (laughs) And deadlift, deadlift, it's very usual to have somebody like, it's very usual to me have somebody come in that they've squatted, they've benched, but they've never, ever deadlifted. I had like a. 48 year old man come in who has a pretty good bench okay squat and like he has never deadlifted in his life so i mean <laughs> we were 48 years behind it's like okay we need to play some catch up yeah so uh, i would say probably it's deadlift is would be if i'm talking gen pop people out of power lifters oh man yeah it's deadlift or squat and probably 50 50 okay so Oddly yeah. enough, most people like to bench. I hate it, but most people like it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I've never liked barbell benching myself. I don't know. It's, it's always been hard on my shoulders. This is the way I'm built, mm-hmm. I think. I don't know. Um, what about you, Mike? Sub goals? I mean, you can almost pick a sport, bodybuilding, strongman, grip, whatever. Um, do you see a focus on sub goals? Yeah. How I think about it is. Uh, what is their main number one goal? Maybe one or two. Eh, ideally, less goals are better. Even three is sometimes tricky, like Phil was saying, just with three lifts. Um, and then from there, I look at what are the other lifts that we can do that will hopefully push up what the the main lift is. Um, so, for example, if I'm doing like some grip stuff, like an axle deadlift, yeah, of course, you know, deadlifting something that's uh, two inches around is probably going to help, right? So that's specific. But just like anyone who's tried to bring up their bench press, you can only make so much progress by increasing frequency of bench press so much. Right? At some point, you may need to do accessory work, which would be next. So things that are common, you know, floor press, tricep work, JM press, whatever, you know, military press. And then after that, you're probably looking at stuff that's contra-specific. Right? If we take the bench press again... I'm going to probably look at doing a lot of rowing, maybe even, you know, chin-ups, pull-ups, things like that. All right, so rowing is going to be the direct opposite of a, a bench press, especially if you flip your, your hands around. Um, and then last is just going to be novel. You know, sometimes people just, you know, want to do something that's a little bit different. Maybe it'll transfer to their gains, maybe not. Um, so for like myself, my weak point right now, if I look at where my axle is, uh, of course, doing specific work on it is going to help. Uh, but I've been switching to doing more uh, thumbless uh, work with it. So double overhand uh, thumbless, or it's called a monkey grip, which is a lot more wrist strength. So I'm purposely taking my thumb out of the equation to work on the other parts of my hand. Mm -hmm. And then I even got super crazy. I ended up buying, uh, it's called a Saxon bar. So imagine a two by six metal bar (laughs) and it's square. So you can grab it with uh, open hands like a big pinch Mm. grip. So now I can train my hands and my fingers in extension, and I can really train that angle between the thumb and the rest of my fingers, but not in a, a closed or supportive grip fashion. And because it's a bar, it's a deadlift position, I can add you know more weight to that than just a single isolatory lift. Um, so looking at different things like that, and then just measuring what is your progress uh, towards your main goal. Um, so that's where I think having some type of other sub goals, maybe even just one per session, uh, it's helpful, and then obviously looking to see are those sub goals, you know, driving you closer to your main goal. Yep, yep. I think from a bodybuilding perspective, I'm I'm guessing you guys will probably agree or at least partly concur with this. But I can tell you one thing: it's generally not lagging. Just like with Phil said, most people have bench pressed before. Pecs, delts, and arms usually not the problem. Like that's not mm-hmm. the weak spot, right? The sub goal would be I need to bring up my back. That's kind of how mm-hmm. we opened this. Honestly, yeah. it's your whole posterior chain. If you want to see beefy yeah. bodybuilders yeah. that look powerful, like a, a silverback gorilla, huge traps, lats, butt, hamstrings, calves, all the way down the back. So some people, they completely ignore calves. Uh, some people, they have very high calf insertions. You know, they're all, they're all chest and deltoid and biceps, you know. Sometimes mm-hmm. judges, because they're so massive through there, they still place fairly highly. 
Um, if I was a judge, I would not place them highly because you're not displaying to me power because that posterior chain just isn't in place, you know, all the way down. Um, so I'm sort of a completist in that way. But yeah, bringing up back work and that kind of stuff. And for me, it's because the back is so complex. I mean, if you're going to do something like low rack pulls or deadlifts, that's going to be way different as far as the way it stimulates even your traps than just a shrug, let's say, you know, or that kind of thing. Or a I don't know, barbell rows and things like that. So Have yeah. you guys found that back can take a lot more stress? Like about two years ago, I switched to pretty much like newer to intermediate like lifting clients. Like I have them do some type of back exercise like literally almost every time they're in the gym. Well, I do the same thing. We do some kind of back work every day. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, and obviously that's going to have a, a big impact, right? Even if you have a a big chest or you have big biceps or something like that. Um, you've got to target things. So bodybuilding is, is almost lends itself to that even a little bit more easily, right? Because it's very, you can very specifically look at these things. Although you have to be careful and not go to all isolation movements either. That's not going to, mm -hmm. that's not going to yeah. build mass. Oh, kickbacks are going to bring up those triceps. Good, <laughs> good, good luck with that. Right. Yeah. No. And I think the back work, like Mike was talking about just now, I think a lot of it has to do with our daily life now. Yes. Um, we're combating our, – our life is very anterior chain. You know? And, like, they, we do nothing with posterior. So, yeah. you know, I'm battling daily life of my clients that are internally rotated and sitting at a computer screen all day. Yes, yeah. So we need to open them up and do lots and lots of back work. So. Yep. And, you know, in a selfie generation, too, I think a lot of these bodybuilders, they're looking in a mirror and they're not seeing yeah. the sad state of affairs out back, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, follow-up question then, uh, Phil, um, and you guys kind of touched on this already as far as zeroing in, but can you maybe just give a little analysis on why you would target just one, just one sub-goal instead of your total, you know, that kind of stuff? Well, when you do that and put all your attention on it, just like anything in life, uh, it's gonna, you're going to get greater progress. It's faster and you can see the fruits of your labor quicker mm -hmm. than if you're splitting time. If you're splitting time, you know, you're just not going to get as much done. Not noticeably. If you want to get a noticeable amount of work done, if you want to be really good at your job, you need to do your job a lot or really good at any one thing. If you want to play the guitar really well, you need to spend a lot of time playing the guitar, not the piano. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just that attention to it. Detail generally shows fruit yeah. quicker. So I would think the caveat would be that you can't expect big gains in your bench if deadlift is your current focus. Yes. You know. Yeah, no, I mean, you can't. And um, so. you know, basically I uh, again, it's dependent. Early on, early on with people that are novice or even low intermediate, I think we can make good gains in everything. Uh you start getting advanced and you're just you don't have enough recovery ability. To, to work mm -hmm. on everything. Like, I can't take somebody with an 800 squat, an 800 deadlift, and a 600 bench and expect to bring them all up at once. They're going to be ruined. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> um, Mike, what about you? Like, you already kind of touched on it, I suppose, but benefits of targeting, like pros and cons, really, of targeting just one sub goal? Yeah, I think the pro is exactly what Phil said. You're playing a game of, you know, how much time do they have to train? What's their recovery capacity? What's their overall stress? All that kind of stuff. So you have to weight that with their ability to come in and do it again. So, for example, I'm a huge fan of, of frequency. So if people can get to the gym more often, I'll start splitting stuff out more. But I have to make sure that they can recover enough and come back and do it again. So for myself, I've split stuff out. Like I'll do a weak point training in the morning when I do my rowing. So I'll just do 10 minutes of lifting, usually some grip-based stuff. And I'll add that in in addition to my normal session, which is in the afternoon, which is a little bit longer. And then I'll do things like just testing to see how much uh, time you need between them. So I said I did Saxon bar, so the pinch grip, uh, three days ago. I'm sorry, four days ago, and then I repeated that exact same session only two days later. So 48 hours later, I got almost the same performance. All right, so that's telling me that at that level, I can probably recover from it faster than what I could before. Therefore, all things being equal, I can push up the frequency. The 
downside I find usually with clients is just the mental side of, hey, we need to you know pin you down and you to pick kind of one to two ish, maybe three at the most goals. And can you just have all those other sub things drive towards that? Uh, so I have a female client now who her goal is to deadlift over 200. She's been pretty close, but it just hasn't quite crossed that uh, threshold. So I said, hey, are you okay with our next program? Like the goal of the next six to eight weeks is to get you, you know, over 200. She's like, yeah, that sounds great. Perfect. All right. So in that case, it's pretty easy because I can kind of write everything moving towards that one goal. So a lot of times it's hard to get clients on board or if they're powerlifting, right, to say, okay, for the next however many weeks to months, we're going to really primarily focus on just bringing up your deadlift or squat or bench or maybe two of them, maybe, you know, and a lot of times it's hard to get them to kind of agree to that because they still want to kind of move three to four things all at once. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, last up, I guess, would be monitoring these things, uh, whether it's strength or size or that kind of thing. Uh, what made me think about this from the bodybuilding perspective is um, uh, most people, and I'm sure this is probably true in other strength sports or not so much at bodybuilding is a pure strength sport, but people, they're sort of self-indulgent and they like to focus on their strengths. You know, my bench oh, is yeah. big, I'm going to bench. My arms are big, I'm going to go get a big pump. You know, instead of turning around and looking in the mirror, you know, kind of thing. Um, one of the things that I did, the last time I competed, I brought up my upper back a lot. Um, but I, I almost had to take pictures because I can't see back there. I'd get, in, you know, the right angle mirror so I could see that because I didn't have enough depth, you know, through my upper back. I felt like I always, my lats were always big enough that I didn't really worry about that too much. But you know, your, your traps are the majority of your upper back, uh, mm -hmm. almost the entirety. And so I, I started doing low rack pulls and monitoring it visually in a way that I just never had before. But it was sort of self-evident to me that, oh my God, I had just been ignoring this sub goal for so long. Like I never wanted to be one of those coat hanger type physiques, you know, that were wide, but flat. You know, <laughs> like depth is the one thing that I value more than probably anything, actually. Front mm -hmm. to back, anterior, posterior depth, you know, like, dude, thick. I mean, that's that's a comment you want to hear. But I had to sort of monitor it in a different way. So I guess, uh, Phil, any tips or tricks um, that you've used with people who might be not seeing a weakness that they should categorize or a uh, target you know, as a sub goal, uh, as far as monitoring, I know it's a hard question, but uh, yeah, it's hard. Um, I I can just tell you that most most of the time, this is a reason why even coaches have coaches because we are all yep. really good at doing what we're good at. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it's real easy when you're like, if I'm writing my own stuff, it's like, yeah, I don't feel like doing that. I'm just gonna do this instead, and it's uh, doing this instead is always something I like. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, human nature. Probably something I don't need to do. Whereas, you know, if I just have somebody else write it down on a piece of paper, well, I'm not going to say no. Like if Jim gives me something, says do this, I'm going to fucking do it. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be like, uh, I'm not going to do what he says. You know, if 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 we take the time to talk and he takes the time out of his day to write something out, I'm going to follow it. Um, right. But uh, you know, it's easy in sport in strength sports. I mean, it's we've got basically we don't really care what we look like um we're looking for movement on the bar if i can do one more rep if i can do five more pounds uh, we're making progress right so i guess what i was what i was tr sort of digging for was would it be the main lift or would it be progress in some accessory movement that was indicative no, of that it sub goal no it could definitely be in, it could definitely be in accessory movements so like uh, that's that's where all this whole topic bleeds into in my opinion is like there's a whole – it's why weak point training exists is because we want to focus on a certain area. Yeah. So, I mean, hey, your squat sucks because your you're mid-back and glutes are weak. So we're going to take time to fix our mid-back and glutes. Yeah. So yeah. we'll put extra work into those. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely – and usually how we ID that, the progress, is look, now you can do that squat and it looks better. You don't have this issue. This issue is going away. Or – 
five out of ten times, you can do it right. So now we just need to get that to ten out of ten. <laughs> so yeah, you know what? You just said something that I thought was a nice gold nugget, which was when you're talking about Jim, you're going to have to have someone helping you monitor this that you take seriously. Yeah. If it's just some guy in the gym and he's like, dude, your low back is weak. Or if he says to me, you know, you're, I don't know, your mid traps are, are not thick. Um, I'm probably going to ignore no, him <laughs> and continue to do my fun stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah uh, exactly. So yeah, you're going to have to find another coach or someone who you actually respect enough to let them monitor you there. You know, in bodybuilding, a lot of times diet coaches are like that, right? They're, uh, somebody feels like they're in shape because they've made tremendous progress. They might have dropped 20 or 30 pounds and, they're, and the coach says, you're eight weeks out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh God, really? You know, and, but if you don't respect that person, you might not believe that, you yeah. know, especially something Well, subjective. and then like in, in, in bodybuilding, the, like your weak points are very visual as far as they are on your physique. In sports, they're not like like it's easy. I can have you strike a pose and hold it and say, "Yeah, this is weak." And here's uh, let me show you. In uh, in in strength sports, it's something. It's usually a form issue that happens in I don't know. A long deadlift is three seconds, so mm -hmm. I can't see that while I'm doing it. There's like it's physically impossible for me to see it. So you need somebody's eyes on you, or I mean, even worse, and snatch and clean and jerk you know 1.2 seconds and there's all this movement going on and this one thing's messed up that's halfway through that so i mean you need eyes on you um it's even sometimes hard to, to catch on a camera because the angle you're at you need to be at the right place at the right time and that's where a, a coach or somebody you trust can come in handy um like if i'm squatting and hey rep three you did this don't do that again well i need somebody telling me that you know because <laughs> i know something went wrong but but what exactly was it so, yeah, Mike, I know you're a fan of videotaping from different angles and stuff like that. I mean, that'd be a, yeah. Uh, do you think you'd still be vulnerable to if, unless you had someone else you respect looking at it with you, would you still be vulnerable to being, no, that's okay. Or do you think the video is so plain in your face that you're like, okay, that must be happening. Yeah, so like several years ago, I thought that if you video it and you could look at it, then you'd be easy to pick everything out. And then what I also realized was it depends on first the angle. So I usually tell mm -hmm. people in general, 90-90, like straight behind, straight in front, straight to the side. Rare exception, I'll use a 45 because that gets kind of weird. Um, the second part, what I started doing with my students is I would video different uh, squats. A lot of times I was the one performing them. And I would play the video and I'd be like, all right, what do you see? And they're like, I don't know, looks good. <laughs> and you're like, okay, look at it again, you know, and you forget that seeing things is mm -hmm. the result of experience and skill. Mm -hmm. So it's not that they don't see the thing. It's like they don't have any part of their brain that's seen that before or knows what to look for. Uh. So I did a lot of, hey, let's do it again. I want you to look at their knees. Okay, what do you see now? Oh, their left knee comes in a little bit. Oh, yes, very good. You know, <laughs> and mm -hmm. it it sounds like insanely basic, but if you spend time around any like really good coaches, they can watch almost any movement and they're like, ah, oh, I think it's this. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I don't know, I didn't see that. What was he talking about? <laughs> right. Um, so I think that's definitely a skill. I think that definitely can be trained. If you're on your own, obviously sending videos to coaches is ideal. Having someone in person is even better. Uh, but another thing that can help a little bit is I'll video something from the side. I'll do the rep. I'll rack the weight. And then I'll be like, okay, what do, how do I think that went from like a speed or do I think I did anything weird? And I'll literally sometimes if I'm really um, doing this hard, I'll write it down. And then I'll go watch the video mm. and to see was I correct or not. Because hmm. I, I made the mistake of trying to think my way through heavy lifts for a while. And don't do that. That's a disastrous mm -hmm. shit show that I wasted way <laughs> too many years of my life trying to do. Uh, you know, sub max weight and stuff. Yeah, I get it. But when it gets heavy, like it, it's just go time and you're going to go with whatever's mm -hmm. unconsciously programmed. Um, but that gives me a way to not have to think about it during the lift. I can think about one cue, you know, stand up, butt back, push your feet through the floor, whatever cues you're using. And at the end, I'll give myself time to reflect back. Okay, proprioceptively, can I figure out what was going on? Ah, I think it was this thing. 
And a lot of times you'll be shocked that when you look at the video, you're not right at all. Mm -hmm. Like you're wrong a lot of times. But over time by doing that, you can then match what you're feeling to mm -hmm. what's actually going on. And again, this isn't perfect. If you can get a coach, it's even better. Uh, but I found that, that that was probably the most useful thing people can do on their own. And that way, if they send the video to a coach or something like that, they're like, hey, I think this is what's going on. Or a lot of times, I'll see a video. My first question is, what did you feel? Because they're like, oh, I only felt it in my left hamstring. Okay, yeah, that kind of matches with what I'm seeing here. Um, so I'm looking to see, can they feel what I'm seeing at the same time? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that yeah. makes sense to me. Uh, one of the things that I would always be worried about if I was trying to assess something myself would be, you know how you can read um, a sentence, and if you keep reading it wrong, you're going to keep reading it wrong. And then you know, a third person will say, you're missing this word. And you're like, oh, yeah, that gr that's grammatically wrong. You know, there's a couple of um, specific ones that really jump into um, you know, mind when people – try to do that kind of thing like it's specifically you're missing something or in a video they show like a big foot walk across the background you know and you, nobody <laughs> sees it because you're too busy focusing on what what almost anybody would focus on you know so sometimes even if you're experienced you just tend to to me those are evidence that people fool themselves you don't see everything you're not looking at something you're not studying it like a scientist you're you're actually visually processing your expectation instead of what's really there you know, kind of thing, but yeah, and, and that's hard because we're, I mean, all of us are unconsciously informed by, you know, that little part of the brain that's filtering stuff out. And it's the reality is it's filtering more things out than mm -hmm. it's letting in. Uh, but I think the way you can change that uh, filter, the reticular activating system is priority, you know, is make it a higher priority to you. You'll probably be more likely to see it. And then I think the other big one, like we talked about is just experience. You know, if yep. you have something that's happened related to it, odds are you can do something with it now. So you're probably more likely for that to be a conscious thing that you're going to see and pick up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, to look for the big foot in the background, right? You're looking yeah. for you're looking for him. Yeah. Yeah. It's the awareness yeah. test. Right. And I did this in class a couple of times where, you know, they're like counting the basketballs being passed between the people wearing. I think it was a white jersey versus a black jersey. Count how many times they pass the basketball. And there's this ape that wanders through. Like, right. Yes. middle of the video yep and you ask him like hey what did you see and it's amazing the first time you're know, like did you see a gorilla suit go through the middle of the video like what what are you talking about exactly but mm -hmm. once you pointed that out it, it's impossible now not to see it mm -hmm. right yep that might be what i'm thinking about actually yeah, yeah. exactly Okay, uh, well, let me summarize some of the takeaways here that I think we just talked about so people can have their gold nuggets. One, training status matters, I think. Uh, you can't just be small or weak and start looking at sub goals. I think that's, that's disastrous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's more of a you know, higher training status or at least mid-ranked kind of people. Uh, two, avoid focusing on the satisfying strengths, right? Uh, three, uh, don't expect gains in the non you know, targeted areas to at least not to the same extent, they might come up, right? Like your total is going to come up because your deadlift came up, you know, that kind of thing. But you can't expect your bench to be spectacularly better if you're working on your deadlift. So mm -hmm. um, assess with an experienced someone you respect. Uh, that would be another one too. Even if it's with a video, you might actually need a third person who knows what they're doing to say, oh my God, you're clearly not doing X, Y, or Z. So... Just sort of a sum up. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other point I would add too is that for sub goals, I think you're looking for things that have maximal positive transfer. If yeah. I build up this sub goal, if I do RDLs, oh boy, that did transfer to my max deadlift. Right. And I think that's the art of coaching is figuring out what those things are, right, from an mm -hmm. exercise standpoint. And then for everyone, and I get Phil's appointment on this too, is that it's not the same. Right. So even mm -hmm. if I get to X level on my RDL and I hit 10 reps, ooh, that did transfer to me. Someone else might do the yeah. same RDL and they only need five reps. Yeah. You know, so it's not always this clear black and white, which makes it fuzzy and the more the art of coaching is involved. Well, yeah. And that's where it comes back down to, like you said, experience and yeah. lots of time dealing with yeah. many, even cues. Yes. You know, one cue may not work. It may just work for one person. 
you know, I probably have cues that I've used that just work for that person. Everybody else is like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> somehow, somehow that person relates to it. Yep. And that goes back to like, a, there was a meme the other day that came up and it was like, if I do a $200 job and it takes me 30 minutes, it's not the time you're paying me for. It's the 20 years it took me to be able to do that in 30 minutes. Yes. And that's the same thing with coaching. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not paying me for my time in there. The, the literal time. You're, you know, you're paying a good coach for the years they have put in to get where they are. <laughs> right. Yes. <clears throat> so Recognize the cues, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And being able to see things. I mean, uh, being able to see, and it's even worse now because we live in a, a, a life of everything's flashed at you in three seconds. Right. The ability to just slow down and see things Study is gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody studies Uh-oh. stuff anymore. You know, they just yeah. consume it. Yeah, they want it in three seconds, and then, okay, move on to the next thing. So. Yeah, and I found that very good, experienced coaches almost appear lazy. Yeah. Like, you see them wandering around just staring at shit all the time, and they don't say <laughs> a lot. You know, but they can do yeah. that because they know what they're looking for, and the thing they say is probably going to be more correct than okay. someone who just wandered into the gym. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. So. You know, one last thought for more advanced competitors is that uh, maybe this is obvious, but there's going to be a strategy behind some of these things like targeting legs or back for mass. That's going to help you move up a weight class a lot better than targeting your chest, right? Just because there's so much meat, Uh, your your lats are the biggest muscles on your upper body and your glutes are biggest muscles overall. I think these are things that like I, I, when I was young, uh, when we started squatting a buddy and, uh, and myself, he put on like 15 pounds over the course of like four months you know, and no wonder people think squatting makes you grow all over. But I think it's also because those are huge muscles. And when they hypertrophy just a few, few percent, it's much mm-hmm. more bang for the buck than if you focused on your biceps, you know. And I got to think the same thing is true with powerlifting totals. Like if you're going to focus on your deadlift and you bring that may come up dozens of pounds, you know, mm-hmm. whereas your bench isn't going to change on that magnitude, I wouldn't think, no. you know. Yeah. Impact on the total, I guess, is what I'm saying. Strategy. Yep. You know. yep. Okay. Um, w- one last thing. Uh, Gabby, who won our most recent contest, should have her prizes by now. So oh, she, she has it. She posted a great pictures. Of her oh. her, so. <laughs> Excellent. Good, good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other than that, um, I guess that's going to be it. We just have a talk amongst ourselves for the next couple of weeks because it's normally a downtime. So if people want to listen, it's probably going to be more me and, and Mike and Phil uh, until the end of the month when we'll, we'll have uh, our next guest on. So we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. See you. Hey, listeners. Have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store, one for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry. And they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store, uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, The stuff you you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, 
please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.